Hey folks, I'm Tom Vassell and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. Well, a lot of things to talk about this week. First of all, uh, if you have not yet signed up to come to Dice Tower Con, don't delay. Go to DiceTowerCon.com and come to the best convention over the summer. It is so much fun uh, in Orlando, Florida for the whole family. You'll have a terrific time and you can sign up for that at DiceTowerCon.com. Secondly, we're going to be at Essen Spiel this week, the big giant fair at, in the Spiel, uh, the Spiel Fair in Essen, Germany. And we have our schedule up on our website, dicetower.com. So if you want to come by and see us or come to our show, all that information is there. We'd love to have you come by our booth. We'd love to say hi to you. We'll have some promos. And we got something neat and new that we haven't had anywhere yet. So there's that. Thirdly, I said this is my Kickstarter update, but if you didn't get that for some reason, all the Kickstarter stuff is being shipped as we speak. It's being staggered shipped because there's so much of it over the next few weeks. A lot of it has already gone out. More is going out now. So just keep an eye out for that as hopefully you'll get your stuff from our Kickstarter soon. And a big thanks from us for backing us there. And finally, I'll be doing a Q&A today at some point, but I don't know when Board Game Breakfast will go up next week. I'll try to record it at Dice Tower, I mean at Essen, and post it next Monday, but there's always a chance it will be delayed until Tuesday. Either way, Week in Review will go up next Monday for sure, and I know that because I've already posted it. Um, don't worry about what's coming up. Oh, you know what? Let's just get to the news. All right, so in the news, first of all, Z-Man has announced they have the rights for Lords of Vegas. Well, I mean, we knew that because Asmo, they bought Mayfair, and this is one of the games. But we're going to see Lords of Vegas come back from Z-Man, including its expansion up and possibly its Underworld expansion, which had never been published. Now, I'm kind of hoping they change the cover. It doesn't look like it because I see the Z-Man logo on this cover. It wasn't one of the best covers, but Lords of Vegas is a great game, so I'll be glad to see this one come back in print. Speaking of great games, a uh, uh, this was a uh, Tetris board game, basically, that Mebo put out. I just reviewed it a few weeks ago, really liked it. Well, Pandasaurus will be bringing this one to America, so that's cool. Fantasy Fight Games is making a new expansion for L5R, a card game called Children of the Empire. This is a huge expansion. It seems like that's kind of what they're doing with this game at this point. 234 cards, three new mechanisms, so if you like that game, lots of stuff coming. Repos has announced Concept Kids Animals. This is a uh, easier version of Concept for kids. I think there's 120 animals and you're using clues to figure out what animal you're talking about. I'm a little worried about replayability since there's only 120 animals in the game, but I do like the idea of taking Concept and using it with kids. Playford has a game called Ancient World multi-game system. So this is not one of those multi-game systems, which always worries me because these multi-game systems usually don't have good games. Uh, Ice House Pyramids is like the exception to that. But you never know. So it's taking a look at older games, you know, like from history and then adding variants and spins to them. So we'll have to wait and see. Hasbro has a line of parody games. They're parodying themselves, so good for them, I guess. Botched Operation. Um, you know, don't mess up too much, I guess, when you're... Uh, was an operation already, botched operation. Game of Life, Quarter Life Crisis. You're in debt now, so how do you survive? Clue, Lost in Vegas. This sounds like it's the hangover, the board game, but... Huh. Sorry, not sorry. One of the most overused and annoying phrases on the internet now in the game. So now it's when you play it, instead of going, sorry, you can go, sorry, not sorry. That's even more annoying. And Mystery Date, Catfished. There you go. I think a lot of these are available at Target or will be available at Target soon. So there you have it. That's the regular news. Let's move the Kickstarter. Hello, fellow gamers. Are you ready to feel the long and steady burn of some euros this week? Because I am. I've also maximized the screen for your little eyeballs pleasure. So let's get started. 
First up, we have Barrage by Cranio Creations. This is for two to four tycoons looking to dominate dead energy industry by strategically placing dams on rivers to direct hydroelectric energy into well-placed power plants, fulfilling those pesky power requirements in order to collect contracts. However, I feel like one of the more interesting mechanics in this game is how your resources are managed. As items spent are placed on this unique construction wheel and remain unavailable until the wheel makes a full turn, which lasts several rounds. This economic worker placement game lasts 60 to 120 minutes and can be backed at $68. Although keep in mind, this project is from a first time creator and could have unexpected delays. Now, if Barrage just plays a little too nice for you, then perhaps Cloudspire by Chip Theory Games will quench your bloodthirst as one to four rival faction leaders organize armies to prepare for battle over the lifeblood of the land called the Source. Strategically deploy troops and heroes issuing them secret command points all while organizing your own defense by purchasing upgrades and building defensive power towers to protect your land in this modular board system that changes throughout the game as tiles are added to the map or even altered as you play the game. Cloudspire takes 90 to 180 minutes to play and is priced at $100. However, if you're looking for something a little more classic looking than maybe Chartered the Golden Age by Jolly Dutch is a better match for you as two to six merchants looking to use their fancy card management skills and economic ingenuity carefully select stocks and place stackable warehouses in Amsterdam. Players can use their warehouse placement to block other players merge companies and collect that sweet, sweet cash, trading out stocks to see who will become the most prosperous merchant in this 60 to 90 minute game that will run you about $40. Now, this company is funding for their first time on Kickstarter, so expect delays as they have to figure out how to manufacture the little nuances of these adorable little stackable pieces. Now, last but certainly the most dramatic is Tidal Blades by Druid City Games. This is a game for one to four champions fighting to become Hero of the Reef. As players use worker placement tactics to gather resources and complete challenges in order to customize their hero stats and actually upgrade their dice, showing off their warrior skills as those beauties roll across the board in this 60 to 90 minute game that challenges players to stomp monsters and impress tournament judges, leading you to victory and becoming hero of the reef. The deluxe version of this game is $89, but will certainly have all of your extra Kickstarter goodies inside. Now, thank you so much for joining me today, guys. If you go to gloryhound.com, you can find out how to join me on Fridays as I talk about all of these Kickstarters in depth. Other than that, I will see you guys all next week. There are some war games that are block games. What's a block game? Combat Infantry, West Front 1944 to 1945. This is a game designed by Tom Dalgleish, published by Columbia Games. It's a World War II tactical combat game, low to medium complexity, two-player game, and it introduces Fog of War. What's Fog of War? Well, something you don't know. You're going into a, a forest, you don't know what's there, unfortunately, there's a machine gun nest, and, well, sayonara. This game does Fog of War beautifully, meaning that there's a block facing you, there's an enemy sticker on the other side of the block, what are you attacking? You don't know. Is it a decoy, a cow, or a machine gun nest? Just imagine, you're on a boat, just about to hit the beaches of Normandy, and this is what you see. Basically, you know there's soldiers out there, the enemy. What's there? You don't know. You haven't attacked it yet, or they haven't attacked you. They're waiting for you. This game is tense. So this is what you don't see when you're hitting the beaches. This is what your enemy has. This is what the board would look like once you get off the boat onto the beach ready to attack. Well, there's another side to this. Your opponent doesn't see your blocks. 
gonna say, damn, this game looks difficult, all those numbers on the chat, no, no, take it easy. They start off really easy with a scenario and move on to a medium complexity game. Going in a clockwise motion, the big number is 3, 2, 1, 1. That's your health. Once you get hit, you turn the block to 2. You get hit again, you turn the block to 1. You get hit again, well, bonjour la visite. On the Columbia Games website, they have a PDF of the rules so you can download it. The game comes with two 16 by 22 inch maps, about 130 blocks, 22 yellow markers, 6 scenarios and rules. Combat Infantry, a World War II tactical game published by Columbia Games, designed by Tom Dalglish. Thank you for watching, if you want to know more about war games, please check out my channel, no enemies here, Wargaming News. See you next week. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Cooperative games often make great board game apps. Well, Burgle Brothers, a cooperative game by Tim Fowers, hit the app stores. So let's take a look at how that cooperative game plays in digital form. In Burgle Brothers, you take on the role of hopefully stealthy burglars working together to crack safes on different floors and escape with loot. Each burglar has a special ability to bring to the team, and the variety of burglars adds a nice amount of variability between games. You'll be moving around different floors, revealing tiles, disarming alarms, leveraging your abilities, and cracking those safes, all while trying to dodge the guards. Lose too many stealth tokens and get caught, and it's game over for the whole crew. The board game is thematic and challenging, and for me, a rare cooperative game that I enjoy. Available on iOS, Android, and Steam, the stylish art of Ryan Goldsberry carries over into the Burgle Brothers app, and that's wonderful. The app does have a tutorial that covers the basics, but it doesn't go into game rules or mechanisms very deeply, and I wish the rules were integrated into the app instead of driving to an external website. Beyond the external rules link, there are a few other user interface rough edges to the app that, while they don't negatively impact gameplay, they do make navigating the app a bit clunky until you get used to it. That said, the Burgle Brothers app features a really nice assortment of gameplay options. Of course, you have the full contingent of thieves to choose from, but you also get to choose from a variety of board layouts and wall placement customization, difficulty adjustments with the guard and stealth, and other gameplay tweaks that allow you to really tailor the game to your preferences or to explore different challenges. Overall, the Burgle Brothers app is a decent port of a delightful cooperative game. The interface isn't a highlight, but all the gameplay you like about the board game is in the app with all those gameplay options. The app is easy to pass and play between a couple of players, or you can tackle it solo. Stick with the Burgle Brothers app and familiarize yourself with the interface quirks, and you'll be rewarded with a solid gameplay experience. Give it a try. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Even though we're going to be at Essen, we have a full slate of games and videos to show you. The cool thing is you're going to see four Miami Dices this week. Um, the Dice Settlers, Camel Up, Heroes of Dominaria, and Fireball Island. So all four of those will be going up this week. And lots of other reviews. I'm taking a look at Fort Sumner, Triangle, Double Cross, Railroad Rivals, Whitewashers, The Big Score, Hen House Havoc, Build or Boom, Cat Crimes, Men at Work, Greedy Kingdoms, and uh, a toy, but I thought it was a cool looking toy, so Gravitrax. Uh, another one of our top tens of our top 100 games of all times is going up this week. And so d some other videos are going up this week, uh, look back and things like that. So just keep an eye out for all of that. And that's what's coming out from Dice Tower. We got some an, another podcast. Oh, no, there is no Dice Tower podcast this week. This is our week off. We take one or two of those over the course of the year. Um, but there might be some stuff coming from Essen this week on our channel. I don't know. It depends on how good our internet connection is. If not, you'll see it coming out the following week, and we'll have it then. But keep an eye out for that. All right.
Let's move on. Hello guys, I'm Cardboard Rhino and welcome to one more Rhino Says Yes. Today's game is one of the most creative party games entailing secret roles, bluffing and lots of twists and turns. It's Secrets. Secrets is a hidden identity game set in the 60s where players are assigned a secret team and they're trying to collect the most points for their side. The cards they get during the game have a character on them who has an effect and also a score which is assigned to the player. The hippie works for nobody and wins if at the end of the game their personal score is the lowest among the players. If you are a member of the CIA or the KGB, your team wins if collectively you have the highest score than the other team. Sounds easy, right? Well, it is, but it's pretty hard to know which are your team members and plus your identity might change during the game and you might even not have the chance to see it. The characters allow you to secretly look at the identity of others, throw bullets, swap the identity tokens and more. In your turn, you flip over two cards in front of everyone, making sure they're not the same ones. You then choose one of them secretly and put the other one at the bottom of the deck. You choose one player to give this card face down. That player can accept it, in which case it goes into their open character cards, or they can refuse the offer, in which case it goes to the cards in front of you. If you get a pair of identical characters, you flip them over and their score is down to zero. There's also the UN, the catch-up mechanism of the game, and is given to a player if and as long as they have less cards than everybody else. With the UN in front of you, you can jump and get a card that is being offered before it's received or declined. The game ends when one of the players has five cards face up or face down in front of them. The interactions between the players that the game creates are unlike anything you'll play. You need to keep up with the changes and also you need to guess the motives of the other players. There's lots of dilemmas and confusion and the best, most satisfying chips to hold in the world. The abilities of the cards are discoverable during the game, so it's a very easy game to teach to people and start playing right away at a party, for example. So Rhino says, yes to secrets, you should definitely give it a go. Greetings and welcome to the Mega Meeple. I am Thomas Krogan and continuing on my weekly segment of uh, for this month of uh, my favorite horror themed board games to play on Halloween. Uh, this time I'm talking about Dead of Winter The Long Night. Now I enjoyed the original Dead of Winter but I gotta say once the standalone expansion of The Long Night came out this easily replaced uh, the, the original as my favorite. First of all just all the additional modules that you could incorporate into the gameplay. It still has the betrayal mechanic, it still has the crossroad cards, but this one introduces the improvements module, the uh, bandits module, and the Raxon module. And also, just the overall c quality of the components are a lot better. I mean, the, the board in the original game were these cheap pieces of paper crap, this one, you have actual board boards. Now, these are one of these games that I recommend to players that are not necessarily into zombies. They're kind of, maybe they're sick and tired of the whole zombie stuff. But I, rec I still recommend this because the zombies are not the focal central point of the game. The focal point of the game is the community of survivors and trying to ob uh, obtain these uh, objectives of gathering food, getting supplies, and, and depending on what module you incorporate into the gameplay as well. So even though this is sort of like a zombie game, the zombies are sort of like on in the background. Ever-present danger, but they're not in your face. Trying to eat your brains. Brains. Hi, Mike Delicio from Solo Mode Games. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about IP or intellectual property. And for years it's been an established practice where a particular piece of media is created and it becomes very, very popular and then that spawns off into other types of products based on that original idea. So you take, for example, Star Wars. You know, this started off as a single film. It grew to become a series of films, but it also spawned a number of different 
products based on that first film. So you had Star Wars books and toys and eventually Star Wars board games as well. This is something that's happened for a number of different intellectual properties. Well, for the first time, I had something happen in the opposite direction, where I played a board game based off an existing IP that I knew nothing about, and I was so interested in the game that it caused me to go back to the original intellectual property and begin to consume that. And the game I'm talking about is called The Reckoners. The Reckoners is a game that was released at Gen Con. It's a cooperative, and I've also played it solo, dice rolling game based upon a series of books by the author Brandon Sanderson. And I was so taken by the game and the world that the game uh, represented that I went and sought out these series of books. They are three young adult novels uh, with this whole kind of world that this board game is created upon. And the books are called uh, Steelheart, Firefight, and Calamity. And I've just started reading the first book. I've got all three on my Kindle right now, but uh, I've just started reading the first book and it's already interesting to see how the game thematically has taken a lot of the elements from the book and have incorporated them into the game. And so I wonder, has this ever happened for you? Have you had a situation where you played a board game based off an existing IP that you weren't familiar with and then sought out that IP? If you could let me know in the comments below, I'd be really interested to hear it. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day. Hey, can we stop with the crazy packaging? I mean, this is a really cool looking game. You blew it and it looks like a piece of dynamite. Neat, yay. And now I got to put this on my shelf and I got boxes on my shelf and I got to put this somewhere and it will fit. This one might fit okay, but you know, I can't lay it like this because it might roll off the shelf. And it's a neat packaging, but even then stores have a problem because stores have all these boxes and then they got to put this one on the shelf. Now this packaging might cause someone to grab your game who might not otherwise. So I get it, but when you put your game in a weird box, a hexagonal box or oddly shaped box, people, the stores don't like it as much because it's harder to fit on the shelf. Uh, and then the box itself can be annoying. So here's another game from Ravensburger, this, yeah, nope. Ooh, that's pretty neat, right? Well, yeah, it's neat, and I know the box is used in the game, but pieces of this box are going to eventually fall off, a couple already have, and the box itself, it just doesn't work as well. Or things like this where it's like, oh, look at this weird, cool packaging, or the worst one of all holes in the boxes. We hate it. Stop doing it. I'm glad you decided to show us part of the game through a hole in the box. But unless I glue that plastic piece that was just sitting there and then the shrink wrap opens it up, that pieces are always going to fall out and stop putting holes in boxes. That's it. I want to use the box to put the game in. I don't want a hole in it. Anyhow. So Box size, though, it's an interesting thing. There's big boxes. It's always been kind of mind-boggling to me how the board game companies certainly don't work together in these box sizes because while there are some standard sizes, you'll see the Ticket to Rise size box. I think they're 11 by 11 and, and Carcassonne, and there's some boxes. When I look at my shelves and look at all the boxes that are over there, they're all different sizes, and they have a hard time. The card boxes where when you they open at the top and the bottom and you have to slide the two decks in, ah, oh, the the boxes that are sitting there and you basically take the plastic off and there, out comes the game and now where are you supposed to store it? The box that once you punch everything out doesn't seem to fit in very carefully. Nah, I'm just whining today about boxes, right? But tell me this in the comments. What's your least favorite kind of box? What's the box you hate and what's your favorite kind of box? Mine is the box Ticket to Ride. I like those style boxes. They're easy to pack. They're easy to move around. You can change the size of them by basically making them taller or shorter. That doesn't bother me. I guess the Thunderstone one's a little excessive, but you know, that doesn't bother me that much, but I like that nice square shape on the sides of them. What's your favorite and what's your least favorite? My least favorite, the ones with holes in them. Anyway, that's what I think this week. Howdy folks, welcome to By The Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from The Family Showdown. Each episode of By The Numbers, we look at a board game numeric related topic. This week's topic, how much are we spending on board games? So I journeyed over to the Dice Tower Facebook group and put up a poll that asked, how much do you, on average, spend on board games each month? 
Let's take a look at the handy dandy chart and we see that the vast majority of people, 86% in fact, spend $100 or less per month on board games. With the biggest category being in the $21 to $50 range. The smallest number being in the 500 plus range where four fortunate or maybe unfortunate if they're busting their budget souls are spending over $500 a month on board games insane I fall in somewhere right about there yep that's me I thought the results would be much higher but when you think about it a hundred bucks a month that's probably what Anywhere from one big game or two or three games a month, maybe four, maybe five if you're getting little tiny games. Several people commented on the poll about how they didn't want to think about how much they were spending on board games. But when they did the math, it turned out to be more than they thought. So let me know how much you're spending on board games down in the comments. Wait, that might be too personal. Let me know how you feel about how much you spend each month on board games. Are you busting your budget? Do you even have a budget? How do you feel about other people spending lots of money? How do you feel about these people that are spending 20 bucks a month? How do they do that? How do they have that much self-control? I want to know. See you next time. Hey folks, today we're going to be taking a look at some stuff from U-Gears. Now their stuff comes, it's punched out of wooden containers like this here, and they have made some stuff that you can use for board gaming and RPG. There's a little bit of rubber bands in a couple of these things. I'm going to be showing you four different things that they make. This here is a card case. So what you do here is you'll press down like this, and then it snaps into place and opens up, and you can put some decks of cards in it like this so that you can take them with you, I guess, if, or you can just use this and pull the cards out of it if you want to. And then at the bottom here, it's on the other side, at the bottom here, you just kind of do that and it snaps shut. So open, snaps into place, snap shut. And it has kind of a really cool look to the whole thing. Uh, really neat here. So that's from you. They also have one of the coolest dice towers that I've ever seen where, I mean, just look at this, watch this. It's really neat how as you drop the different pieces down, it kind of, the, the flaps themselves are going to move along. This will, these will move as you drop it down. And then the whole thing comes apart very easily. It's easy to put together and back. I mean, don't get me wrong, putting it together initially is a lot of work, but once you have it together, the dice come down and drop out pretty neat. So that's a, a dice tower. And of course, you know I like those. Next we have this box here, which almost looks like a jewelry box, but we're going to take off this thing here in the back for counterweights um, you can this 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 could be locked you can unlock it to lift off the lid here and drop this and then slide out the the different pieces here like that it just bends back like that and here's a, a big card tray you can see I can put all these cards into the card tray like this. I'm thinking right away that this I would use this for is Eldritch Horror where I can put my little cards up here at the top and my regular cards down here. And one of the cool things about this one is, is that when, again, when you're done with it and you snap the top on, you can't do it with the top row, but the rest of the cards you can keep inside it. And then again, like I said, it has this here in the back that kind of just counterbalances the whole thing, but then you can lock it. And let me get this through first. There we go. And then the lid won't fall off when you turn it upside down. So that's a pretty neat thing. Also, of course, that really looks gorgeous on the outside. And then last but certainly not least, we have this giant shield here, which is for Dungeon Masters. So in the middle, there's a dice tower where you can drop in these dice and they'll only be seen by you. It has these rubber bands where you can put in the different sheets and the different things that you need. And then when you're done, all these, these just slide right into there. This pops up, and this closes like this. And it has almost like a book feeling to it. It has this neat, you know, this all fits together. You can snap these into place here on the side. 
and then there you're done. It's a pretty neat thing. Not something I would use as much as the other ones because I don't play many uh, role-playing games, but it looks really neat. And again, because these are all movable parts. So of the different things, I think the dice tower is my favorite, but this one might see the most use just because of how neat it is to put the cards in and snap them out. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. <laughs> Bang! Shoot! I'm going to the moon! <laughs> oh! I get it! It's like a PSA! What do you mean? It's like a public service, service announcement. It's like bringing awareness about like the horrors of domestic abuse and such. Okay, that makes way more sense. Okay, I get it. Now, okay, I'm here. I'm with it. The Honeymooners? Yeah. Uh, no, it's not a PSA. It's just a sitcom. That's a, this is for laughs. This is a comedy? Yeah. It's like a satire? Like The Daily Show? No. This is just a straight up comedy that's centered around domestic abuse? Not centered, but like it's in its gravitational pull. Why was this funny? I don't know. It really hasn't aged well. Also, how long are they on honeymoon for? Is the honeymoon phase like a, like a year tops? I think they skipped it and the whole thing was like they're trying to hope to find the honeymoon phase. And you get that through domestic abuse? Again, I don't think like the protagonist was known for like his brains. Oh. More his punching. You wanna watch The Good Place? I wanna watch anything else. All right, this is the Honeymooners. As you can totally see, it's roll and move garbage. You're gonna go ahead and pick one of these surprisingly cool minis, and you're gonna be rolling and moving and going around the board, and essentially you're trying to go to the four corners, which have different stuff, like you gotta go get your best friend Norton, you gotta try to get a promotion at the bus place that you work at. So once you go here, you're gonna draw the top card of it, and oh no, Norton's not here. But then maybe you come back around again, you try it again, you're like, oh cool, Norton's here. First person to get to all four wins. That what? The honeymoon is <coughs> game. <laughs> the game itself, I mean, it's a normal mass market roll and move garbage game. I like the look of it. Like, I like that kind of. Our style is really cool. It's got some pretty fire minis. It seriously got these, like. For the 80s. For, like, 1986, which is when this game was published. It's got some super fire, like, minis. They have, there's, like, six of them. They're all in different colors. I mean, these are great. And, like, we understand that the show is from, like, a different time. But that doesn't make it okay. For half a second, I thought like, oh, there's, there's a, all these spaces with lines. I'm like, it's a line management game. Maybe it's something. No. <laughs> so I was like, maybe it's something. It's like guillotine or something. Anyway, that's going to be it for us. Make sure to check out our YouTube channel. Check us out over on Twitch. Yeah. Until next time, we're going to see you in the Raccoon's Lodge. <laughs> Ralph. Hey everyone, Chris Renshaw here. And remember when we went super duper speedy through all the 5e books? Well, we're about to do it again as we move into my Numenera. All right, before we get to Numenera, but still Monty Cook, we have No Thank You Evil, which is a game that plays for kids as little as like three to five or so and teaches them all about RPGs. Then we have the huge Numenera Reliquary box, which is like a special edition collector's thing that's not available. It's got just like extra deluxe maps and rule books and etc. Then you've got the original Numenera rule book. And then you have Numenera Discovery and Destiny that I talked about for the new rule books. Then you have the Cypher Chest, which is a bunch of cards. Then it's a nice little container for all your cards. It has like ciphers, GM intrusions, XP, etc. Then you've got into the Deep, which is like, what's creeping in the bottom of the ocean? What's creeping out in outer space? What's creeping into parallel dimensions? Then this, this is one of my favorites, Jade Colossus, Ruin of the Prior Worlds. This basically allows you to build like epic dungeons like randomly using different rooms and stuff and that still give it that Numenera like lost world kind of feel. Then of course you got your, you know, your bestiary and your bestiary too. Uh, then you've got a guidebook that's just more about like, hey, what's the ninth world about? Um, then there was a there was a video game called Torment Tides of Numenera, and this was like an expansion book that they came out that kind of described the setting that the game took place in. And then uh, just another setting that came out in conjunction with Discovery and Destiny. And then rounding out the end of this shelf is the new Overlight RPG from Renegade Game Studios and some assorted uh, maps and adventures there. So there you go, that is 
I'm pretty sure this is most of all the, the Numenera books. There might be like one, I think there's like one I don't have, but that is everything when it comes to Numenera. So there you go, there's all the Numenera stuff I have. Did you find anything that struck your fancy more than the others, more than interests you? Let me know down in the comments below. And make sure you follow me on all the different social media platforms and check out the Boards and Swords podcast. And until next time, may all your hits be crits. It's your turn. Ooh. Hey guys, I'm Ellen. And I'm ready. Uh, we're sticking with the new format for now of me saying my name first. Yeah, or you just beat me to it, yeah, and I'm mad right. now that you beat me to it. <laughs> it's a new game. This is a this is actually a Kickstarter announcement. It's yeah. called uh, Say Your Name First. Say Your Name First. So I it's won going tonight. live tomorrow. <laughs> we're looking for ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars. That's all we asked. <laughs> ten thousand. Um, okay, so let's be serious for a second. We're talking about Downforce tonight. Yeah, great. Uh, like yeah. higher end count game. Um, five six players would be fantastic um yeah. we've only played with what three four and yeah. i think and i played with five once i've never played the full player count yeah. uh it's really good at high counts um it's like a bidding game more than i think than yeah, a more racing, than racing game definitely more than yeah um i did not expect to like this game and i really really liked it and part of the reason is i get really stressed when it's like a racing kind of game and I'm way the heck behind yeah. and I know I ain't coming back and I'm just like, well, whatever. And I just kind of want to give up. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I flip the table and walk away. <laughs> but in this game, you're able to place bets on people that you think are going to win like throughout the race. So, so even for some reason, you're not opportunities. You're not in the lead. Uh, you bet on the, on the car that's in the back. But a lot yep. of times the cars in the back end up kind of gaining in the, in the end because yeah. um, eventually you've played all the red color yeah. for instance and then right. you don't have any red left and then red kind of stalls yeah it's really cool i did not expect it like as much to do but it's really light too so if you just want something quick like you're waiting for people to show up and they never do you know who you are again um it's just fun to get this one out and gets through really quick and it's pretty light too it's very light right this it's, is a light it's, game it's really light yeah it's really light game. anybody can pick it up anybody can pick it up yeah. uh the danger circuit expansion is great actually mm -hmm. i um I like the one with like the rumble track, yeah, uh, rumble. like the off-road kind of a yeah. thing. It's like every two, um, you know, if you get on the outside, it's you have to move two spaces for every one. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of neat, kind of push people off to the side. It's yeah. cool. The loops, I think, is pretty good. Um, not I my like favorite, loops. but I like it. And then there's obviously uh, you like the Monaco. Monaco, game. yeah. I'm big he's F1 like a fan, huge so F1 guy. So he's like Monaco. A Monaco street Twister. circuit, you know. <laughs> yeah, he loves it. It is cool though. It's cool. Yeah, I like F1's it a lot. Cool. But anyways. We really like this game, guys. Yep. Stay tuned for the photo of the day. Yep. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys, and welcome to the Tantrum House After Party. I'm Will Meadows. I'm Sarah Meadows. And I'm Melissa Delp. Today, we're looking at fireworks from Renegade Game Studios. We're going to talk about what we loved, what we hated, who won, and how. So this is a tiling dexterity game. What did we love? I loved that it's uh, tiling that you can rearrange your tiles, although one downside is there's a lot of AP when you add that factor in. <laughs> the, part of the, the version of the game that we just played, we used all the cards that allow you to switch up how you roll the dice each time, which makes it a whole lot more of a party fun type of game, which I really enjoyed. You've got the big chunky dice, which really does uh, create some fun as you're trying to just flip as many tiles as you can for your turn and that just your turn. Yeah, I tended to <laughs> flip the tiles, but then I couldn't take them, so I really helped Will out during Which the game. Which I appreciated. Yeah, I had several turns where none of the tiles got flipped, although when I played the normal variant where you just drop the die out of the barrel, uh, I only had one turn that that happened on, so I think that's something that may happen with some of the fun variants that are added in the game. Yeah, well, those variants do include things like the speed variation where you're just drawing them out and putting them together as quickly as you can. I wouldn't like that part of the game. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah, you actually won. Right? I did actually mm -hmm. win. Yeah, that helped a little bit. What do you think was the reason that you won? Was it because you took the time to put the tiles out? Was it the what you got lucky with drawing? Um, I think it had to do with how I rearranged the kaleidoscopes and Saturns. Those gave me more points than trying to make one big 
fire work with all of my tiles. And did you use your character card? I did use to my get character bonuses? card to get three extra bonus points. And yeah, put me ahead. Mine was getting Saturns, and I didn't get any of them, so I didn't get any points for my bonus tile. And I didn't quite max out my fast puppy, but I did get a couple extra points off of it, which is not too bad. So, if this sounds like something you would enjoy, check out Fireworks from Renegade Game Studios. And then if you missed the playthrough, go watch that as well. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us. Folks, we're here with the Sadler brothers. Uh, very, very infrequently are their brother designers. In fact, I can't think of many off the top of my head at all. I'm pretty sure there's very few twin brothers. I can barely, like, do any kind of project with my brothers. How, how do you guys work in get? How did that all start? It's challenging. It's very challenging. Like, uh, we've been lots of creative endeavors, and we always end up doing them together. We used to be musicians. We played in bands together. When we started uh, to get into games, we decided let's design games together. So it's always been something that whenever we're doing something creatively, we always have to create something in that environment, and we just naturally do it together. So We just happen to have very similar interests, and they just always overlap, so we like to do the same things. <laughs> yeah, I just realized we did not uh, like introduce you guys separately. <laughs> Who are you guys, real quickly? Uh, I'm uh, Brady, Brady Sadler. Uh, Adam Sadler. And how would people have known you guys? Have they maybe played one of your games before? Uh, I think my first big game was uh, Descent 2nd Edition um, when I was working at FFG. Um, since then, Brady and I have designed Warhammer Quest The Adventure Card Game, uh, Walking Dead No Sanctuary, Heroes of Terranoth, Street Masters, Brook City. Uh, I'm probably missing a few, but those are the big ones. Those, those are the ones, the memorable ones. <laughs> Well, that's kind of an interesting thing because, you know, Fantasy Flight does not have a, a huge amount of designers that did all these games. And you guys got your hands uh, on one of the biggest, you know, brands around the Terranoth universe. We're able to do things with like that. How did that even happen? Uh, for Descent, you mean? Yes, sir. Yeah. when uh, I got a job there as a game producer. Um, and what introduced me to the company of uh, Fantasy Flight Games was Descent. Uh, I thought it would remind me of Hero Quest back in the day. So I, I got into Descent. I liked it. And so I found out about FFG. When I started working there, I was a game producer, and I saw on the schedule that Descent 2nd Edition was coming up, and I was like, I told my manager, I have to work on that because I love Descent. And that turned into me just becoming the lead designer because I, they didn't have a designer at the time, so I was just doing stuff, and I was designing. Like the, They said, go for it. <laughs> so I kind of, yeah. So you've gone from that now to you're still making games with that extremely strong thematic tie to them. Like Descent 2nd Edition definitely had a lot of strong, it wasn't just kick the door down and kill everybody. There was a storyline and things involved. And now we come all the way up to new stuff like Street Masters, which is a very strong theme. What, what drives that? Well, I have a strong writing background. Um, I Before I got into game design, I was a novelist, so I pretty much just wrote. Um, so that really got me into storytelling, world building. Um, and that's actually what really got me into gaming. Um, I didn't play a lot of highly strategic games. I'm not very competitive in nature. I mostly just play cooperative games, and we obviously design a lot of cooperative games. So the world building is always something I'm always going to be doing, no matter what kind of creative endeavor I'm in. So our games just naturally always lean toward thematic gaming because that's pretty much why I wanted to get into games in the first place. So what made you guys then decide to go off kind of on your own and make these games? Um, there was like a lot of factors into what caused us to leave FFG, um, you know, family stuff. And basically, we, you know, when you're, when you're doing games full time at a, at a publisher, you're kind of doing what's assigned to you and, you know, you're going with, pretty much in the company's vision and so we you know we enjoyed it we learned a lot at ffg but we kind of want to do more of our own things and so we got corporate jobs and, and decided we wanted to do games on the side as freelancers um and that way we could kind of pick and choose what projects we did and have more creative control over what we got to put out and for me it was just the the amount of work I, i've always want to take on new projects and when when i was at ffg i couldn't freelance i couldn't work for other publishers i just had that one publisher so i could only do so much there and i just wanted to be, you know, be more uh, prolific. In <laughs> they also didn't. They also didn't want us to work on projects together at FFG because we were <laughs> brothers, and so that was kind of a hurdle we had to get through. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. Well, I guess it all came together. So let's talk a little bit about Street Masters here, because this is one of the games that you guys worked on uh, together. Street Masters. Now, it has a look. When you look at the front of it, it looks familiar. What are the, what are the underlying things that kind of 
or thematic or that gave you the ideas for this game? So obviously when we were approached to, to, for this game, a blacklist really wanted to do something inspired by these arcade fighters in, in their mind. They, they had these, some of these character sketches ready and they were all like these really, you know, street master in, or street fighter influenced um, head to head fighters, but they wanted to do a more of a cooperative. They, they said like dynasty warriors or something where it's beating up mobs of guys. But Adam and I, when we heard this pitch, we're like, we're doing a beat em up game, straight beat em up, like Double Dragon, Final final Fight, stuff like that. That's where our childhood resided. So we had to go that direction. So there is some of that aesthetics from like those, you know, head to head fighting games, but it's very much more inspired by those, you know, beat em up, beat all the bad guys, get to the boss, take them down, that style of game. Well, quick aside, what is the best of those beat em up video games? Double Dragon for us. I mean, that's yeah. pretty much, I mean, twin brothers beating up a bunch of bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, the realistic themes, of course. Yeah, there's a lot of those great ones. I definitely played, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, that's a good all one. All that yeah. stuff, and the X-Men was my favorite. I love but, that one. So to take something like that where you're walking through and you're just fighting and punching and kicking and throwing garbage cans and stuff, that seems like a challenging thing to bring into the board game arena. Yeah, it was. One thing we we really wanted to avoid right away was any sort of kind of I, I never want to say mindless, but there are games that are a little lighter in the you know in the thought process on your turn, um, where you're kind of just chucking some dice and taking out big hordes of plastic guys. We didn't really want to pl- design that because we don't play a lot of games like that. So we really wanted to dive in deeper and, and think about the all the combos and stuff you can do in these head-to-head fighters, but take that into the arena where you're using cooperatively against all these different you know all these bad guys and a big cinematic uh, movie scene. So we wanted to make a more thinky, strategic, cooperative, car-driven game with that theme. And it it was kind of a challenge because when you pitch that theme, initially people are going to think, okay, we're just chucking dice and and knocking dudes over and and it should be like a half an hour game and we're good to go. But we wanted to go beyond that. And one thing that Brady was really, really adamant about is he wanted to do fixed fixed decks in the game. So all the fighters would have their own individual decks and they all play very differently. And then there's also all the bosses have their own decks and all the stages have their own decks and they can all mix and match. Yeah, um, modularity so, was a huge thing. Yeah, so it's like basically we wanted, we wanted to create this game where you could fight in any kind of environment and in any kind of enemy and you could mix and match, kind of make your own scenario without having to refer to any rule, like you know, scenario book or something. You just put the decks out and go. So then does that make the game exponentially more difficult as you add more stuff because you have to test it with everything that's come in the past? <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. The modularity is a blessing and a curse because it's really fun and exciting to design for, but you have to approach it in the sense where you, you have to remember everything that's been done and is this going to interfere with anything? And luckily the rule set the, the actual rule book's not super complex. It's not like a really heavy rule book. Um, it, it builds a nice framework. The cards pretty much drive everything. So the, the rules are open enough where the cards can dictate what the scenario does and they have all the special rules on the cards themselves. So that is the good part about the design is the content itself is essentially kind of all, you know, in its own little void, you just kind of sock it into the game. That was kind of the idea of it behind the initial design. And the cool thing is some of the biggest fans of the game that we talk to online who play it all the time say they love the game. They play it all the time, but they've barely even gotten past the base game. And there's still a few expansions that they got. They haven't even touched yet. <laughs> so so you decided to make more content than to help with that. <laughs> Let's bury you more. <laughs> well, speaking of burying, the, the new one is Aftershock. Does that have to do with earthquakes? What, what, what's, what's the name mean? It's, it's kind of, uh, it's like the aftermath of a missile strike in a city. So it's got this kind of nuclear uh, post-apocalyptic type vibe. Um, it's not like zombies and, and everything, but it's, it's just mutants in a decaying city and lots of nuclear signs everywhere. So it's, it's very much those like 1980s, 1990s beat up games. And, you know, for like NES and Genesis, where it was always, you know, mutants and, and, and some evil, pharma- and some <laughs> evil pharmaceutical company comes to clean up, but they have other agendas that the yeah. fighters discuss and all kinds of fun stuff so this one has like a storyline like missions based to go through yeah yeah it's it takes the idea from the story decks in the base game because the story decks in the base game they well they we should say that there's two ways to play the game there's arcade yeah. mode and story mode and arcade mode is what we're talking about mix and match and anything 
and story mode are decks that kind of guide you what you put what the scenarios are going to be yeah they tell you what decks to use and what um when what uh sequence you know from uh from stage to stage and you can get upgrades from your from your fighter story decks because we wanted to make a create your own campaign system for this so you have like a main story every fighter has their own individual story deck you can sock it in so every fighter gets their own little story to add onto the story and then the aftershock we're adding the showdown decks which adds enemy stories which is another element you can sock it in so it's going to make this branching path that you kind of create yourself so that even adds more to the modularity of the game yeah this is an example of a story deck so it's not even that big there's just a a deck of cards that kind of tells you okay well this this is this enemy at this stage. Here's the story. And on the back, there's the outcome. It tells you what card to go to next. So that this, you don't have to word, reference a book or anything. It's all just a deck of cards. Like to go through one of these stories, how many times would you play maybe? Well, it depends because there's there's branching paths. So if you if you play one story and you win, you'll go down a different path. If you lose each stage, each stage has two different outcomes. that go. To, so the narrative will change. And also sometimes the objectives of the next stage will change and you might get rivals with you or you might get allies that or the, the rivals will fight you, but the allies will come help you and they can sw- switch sides. They can change their alignments and stuff. So there's a whole lot of things we can do with story decks. It's, it's a lot of design space. We haven't even scratched the surface of yet with the base game. So Aftershock's expanding more on that because we want to dig into more. Like, for example, the, the Aftershock main story is about you and a group of survivors trying to survive this, the aftermath of this nuclear strike. And you have these rivals and allies that keep switching sides, depending on if you have enough food to feed everybody or if you have enough, you know, uh, base of operations, stuff like that. So it's going to affect who's going to fight with you and who's fighting against you. Yeah, he was asking how many how many games are, are in a story, like how many games do you? Oh, play? how many individual like, games? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, sorry. The main story, there's five stages, but each uh, hero story you add, each fighter story adds another stage to that. So um, you can kind of create your own experience, how long you want to play that yeah. campaign. In four in a four player game at most it's nine games for the right now for yeah story. plus the showdown with ex- expansions gonna add the showdowns in there so it's one yeah. more for per showdown. So if someone has never played this before, is this an okay jumping point on for them? Uh, Aftershock is great because the Kickstarter is going to we're all out, we're out of stock on everything um, from the first wave of the first print run so we're reprinting everything and the Aftershock Kickstarter is going to be a great value. It's going to be a lot of stuff. But it's a great value for a lot of stuff. Um, and if you just want just the base game, you can go there and get just that, or you can get the base game and aftershock and everything if you want. There's going to be uh, quite That's a few how options. Much stuff like a box. Uh, <laughs> here's a here's a white box sample we just got. The storage box the aftershock comes in. Now aftershock is just an expansion, but it's going to come with this huge box. It's going to have uh, card wells and token trays in here. It's going to hold all of your content. If you want to put everything in here, you can. Um, and this is what the actual expansion comes in. So if you buy Aftershock, you'll get this box with the expansion in it, and you can dump all your stuff in here with it. I think that box almost is as tall as it is wide. It's you almost a perfect cube. But it's a little a perfect short. cube. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nice and sturdy. It, it feels great. I'm a, I'm a big st- storage box aficionado, so I'm pretty excited about we, this. We, we did have a little video on uh, Blacklist's Facebook page. We did like a live video of us opening it and playing with it. So if anybody's curious, they can go check it out. So when, so when is this coming out? Uh, it's Aftershock. October, October 23rd, which I believe is tomorrow when this airs. Um, it so, is tomorrow. Yeah, so it's we're pretty excited. It's about a, a week and a half right now, but yeah, it's, it's creeping up on us. <laughs> all right, folks, if you're looking for a game and you want to play these old, you know, Ninja Gaiden and all these type of games and you want to play it as a board game, this is certainly one to check out. Hey, guys, we really look forward to seeing what you're going to come out with in the future. Thanks for talking to us today. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. us. See, twins in unison. All righty. <laughs> Let's keep going on with the show. On this episode of Gaming with the People, we've bribed our children with Rice Krispie treats Mommy. to allow us a moment to play a game. And the game today was Jaipur. Lloyd, can you say Jaipur? Jaipur. Not without much Rice Krispie treat in your mouth. <laughs> Jaipur is a two player game. Lloyd, did you and I play together? Uh, no. No, I played with Daddy. It's an adult game. Jaipur is a great two-player game. Uh, You have two simple actions. You either uh, take cards or you sell your cards. If you sell your cards early, you end up with these chips that are worth higher points. And so you say, oh, well, geez, just trade your cards in as soon as you get them. But there's a push your luck element because if you hold off just a little bit longer, there are bonuses for three, four, or five. Hard sets. 
It's kind of fun. You're buying, you're selling. I love to buy. Just ask Dan. <laughs> what I really like is that the cards are very colorful, easy to identify. <laughs> Thanks, Vanna. The other downside is that you do have to reset after every round. And so the resetting is somewhat... Tedious. Yeah, that's the tedious part, is the resetting. You need a reset button. Where's your reset button? This is a quick game, plays in about a half hour. Cool little components, cool cards. This has been Gaming with the... People. This has been Gaming with the People. So go ahead and like and... Subscribe. Subscribe. Hit the subscribe button. And peace out. Peace out. Is that a good catchphrase? Yeah. We should have had a meeting about this. Happy breakfast, everybody. And this week, I'm really excited because the countdown to Essen is nearly over. Now, this is going to be my first time going to the event, so I'm not too sure what to expect. But here's a couple of games that I'm excited to see at the event and hopefully bring home with me as well. The first one is Railroad Inc. Now, I think I'll probably care more for the blue one as it sounds less destructive, but it's a roll and write game. Now, I've not really played too many of these, apart from like years of Yahtzee before proper games came in, but I'm excited about it because it's not numbers you're writing down. Even Welcome To, the numbers you write down, it makes sense, but it's still numbers. Now this, you're doing railroads, railways, you're doing roads, they're intersecting, it's kind of cool. I like the look of it, really excited for that one. The next one has to be Thunderball Island. Now, apparently the game isn't gonna be for sale there, but there is gonna be a demo copy, and I'm definitely gonna try and make sure that I get a chance to play this one, because it looked great during the Kickstarter, Let's be honest, who didn't enjoy sort of marble runs when they were younger? And this just looks like it's combined marble runs, board gaming, smash that together. That's going to be fun, right? I didn't play the original, so I don't have a comparison to draw on there. But I'm excited by the idea of it. And Restoration Games has got a pretty good sort of list of games that they've done, let's be honest. Quickly, an expansion I'm really excited for is Terraforming Mars Colonies. Now... I've enjoyed most of the expansions. I've really enjoyed Hellas and Elysium, the maps. I kind of enjoyed Venus Next, but it kind of drew a little bit away from the experience. Prelude was amazing. Absolutely love that. Won't probably play without that anymore. And Colonies maybe falls under Venus Next of adding too much because you'll be sending fleets off to colonies to get resources and stuff. I don't really know quite how it works. Maybe it's too much, maybe it's like the better two, I don't know, but I'm excited to try it nonetheless. Anyway, if you're going to be at Essen, hopefully I'll see you there, maybe even play a game. If you're not, I'm sure there'll be enough coverage on the Dice Tower and beyond. Anyway, thanks for listening to me waffle on, and I'm Oliver East, signing out. Welcome to The Pitch. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Dave Luza and I am very excited because yes, Essen Week is here. Every day I'll be making videos and going live on some of the days to show you all the hot stuff, all the new stuff, trying to give you an idea of what it feels like to be in Essen if you cannot make it yourself. Um, I'm gonna do that over on my YouTube t channel, so that's youtube.com slash the happy loser. Join me there, um, you can ask me uh, questions there if you want me to take a look at some stuff. If I find the time, then I will make sure to, to drop by and put in some pictures on, or some video, maybe even talk with, uh, with the designers if I can make that work. You're gonna see some very familiar faces there. Um, of course, the Dice Tower is there, so I'll, I'll make sure to, to add a couple of uh, conversations with them in here as well. I'm gonna go to the Dice and Mystics event. I am going to go to the Deutsche Spiele Preis gala the press conferences I'm just gonna give you the whole whole Essen experience my wife Ilka is there my son Bo is there it's going to be amazing so join me on youtube.com slash the happy loser Essen week Rawr!
Keyforge. 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 That game that keeps on throwing around the word quadrillion like it's a normal word to use in a board game. It's not. It's not a normal word to use. It's bizarre. It's crazy. It's new and it's terrifying. Keyforge. Richard Garfield's answer to the problem that Richard Garfield. Anyway, Richard Garfield's new game, Keyforge. It's blooming exciting, isn't it? I think I really, really, really like it. But how do I know I like it? Because it's not out yet. Or is it? No, it's not out yet. It, it just isn't. But there is a website. It's called thecrucible.com forward slash play, where you can go online and you can play Keyforge. Now, this comes off maybe as an advertisement for Keyforge, which I'm sorry about that. I don't mean to. I'm not being, I'm not backed by big Keyforge money or anything like that, or any money, really. But I'm very excited. Will Keyforge be the game that goes to number one in my top, all the top games of all, uh, top of the tops all time ever of the tops? Probably not. Will it kind of fade into obscurity? Could do. But at the moment, man, I am really excited about Keyforge. Here's a heads up, little, uh, little insider from the insider. <laughs> insider information is the wrong term because I'm very much an outsider. But here's something that you could do if you really are interested in the game is go and try it online. So if I see you inside the Keyforge forum, I guess, I don't even know the right terms. But if I see you in there, I'm there as Matthew Jude and we should play a game. Haven't won one yet, but nothing new there. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast, folks. Thanks so much for watching. Yeah, I sure hope to see some of you at the Essen Fair. Come by and say hi to us there. Uh, I hope that uh, for those of you who aren't going to be there, that you enjoy our videos this week. Thanks so much, as always, for all your support and watching our videos. We passed 200,000 subscribers this past week, so that was a cool thing, and we really appreciate all of you who take your time to subscribe to the fire hose of volume that comes out. That's pretty impressive. Anyway, we'll see you guys next time. Until then, I'm Tom Vassell and you've been watching The Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.